will speak or and try to emphasize all the benefits of being a member of the organizational design community. And for those of you that are not member yet, currently, I think uh, it would be interesting to look into becoming a member. Today, uh, the webinar uh, will be on organizational design and power. And the speaker will be Jerry Jerry, who's from the University of Michigan, where he's a professor of uh, sociology and business administration. But I understand that Jerry uh, right now is in California, where he is a um, fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science at Stanford. So welcome, uh, Jerry. Even it's very early in the morning, we look forward to your presentation. So the screen is yours. All right. Uh, th thank you so much, Borg. Uh, I do have to tell you that I did just renew my organization design community membership yesterday. And so I am now a, a member in good standing. I encourage everyone else to do this. Uh, I can also tell you that if you don't, Fanish Puranam will contact you personally and say, where's your dues this year? So he's, uh, he's very, very good about, <laughs> about keeping track of that. Uh, I also have to say uh, it, the uh, paper that was distributed is with Asim Sinha, who's a uh, doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan. He's on the call today. I have to say uh, any of the parts of the paper that you liked are, are attributable to a seam and, and any of the bad stuff, uh, that, that's because of me. Uh, it's coming out in a new journal called Organization Theory that's been launched by, uh, I think, EGOS, the same folks that publish organization studies. Um, this is a new journal that I think will be also of interest to, to members of the organization design community. So I'm going to be uh, talking about the, the topic of uh, design and power today, and I'm spending the year at the Center for Advanced Study in California at Stanford, uh, working on a book on corporate power in the 21st century. And the theme of this, uh, this book is really about how the nature of corporate power uh, looks very different in a 21st century corporation than a 20th century corporation, and that there's a kind of a mismatch between the tools that we use uh, to analyze and understand power for a Westinghouse or an Eastman Kodak compared to the kind of firms that we have today. And I think it has some important implications for, uh, for organization design. Uh, I do want to post uh, some uh, set of links here in the chat. So any of the crazy things that I say in the talk uh, and you're wondering what's the documentation for that, uh, here's a list of articles that you can uh, click through to uh, if you're interested. I like to open with this lovely painting by Fernand Leger. I, I use this as the, as the opening for most of my talks because I think it's quite a posit for the situation we're in now. It's called A Girl with Flower, and, and it sort of is a metaphor for what I want to talk about today. You see that it's got a, uh, this uh, dense outline of a woman's face, and she's got a necklace and a shawl, and you can sort of see the top of her, her dress with this sort of pattern on it. And then it's got this strange looking flower that's sort of jagged looking. It's a very elaborate pattern. And then these very simple color blocks in red, green, yellow, blue, uh, that are very, very simple, and they don't match up. And to me, this is a metaphor for the mismatch that we're currently facing between our understanding, uh, the way that we talk about the economy, like corporations or firms and employees and industries, very simple categories in the world that we're encountering that seems to uh, belie that simplicity. So that's kind of the underlying theme uh, for the talk. And I want to start, um, we in the US, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, we recently had an election. Um, not sure how it turned out. I haven't really been paying very close attention, but apparently it was a big deal here. Um, and there's been this diagnosis shared by many of us uh, on the left and elsewhere that unbridled corporate power is corrupting American democracy, that corporations have just too much control in democracy these days. Uh, they're expanding and consolidating in ways that concentrate economic and political power. Uh, corporate money is corrupting politics to favor the rich. Ineffective state regulation is creating a small class of enormously wealthy and economically powerful men whose chief object is to hold and increase their power. And last, economic inequality is reaching unprecedented and unsustainable levels that belie our ideals about uh, equality and opportunity. And this sounds like pretty much every Democratic candidate for the presidency and pretty much everyone on the left 
uh, would agree with this diagnosis of what's gone wrong uh, today in the US. Uh, the surprise is that this diagnosis actually came from Teddy Roosevelt in 1910, uh, at the time when the American economy had first become corporatized. He was giving a speech to uh, Civil War veterans in Osawatomie, Kansas in 1910, and the speech was called The New Nationalism. And Roosevelt gave this diagnosis of how corporations were sort of ruining uh, democracy. And he came up with a set of uh, suggestions about what should be done in response to that. A graduated income tax, at the time the US didn't have an income tax, uh, an estate tax so that wealthy estates, you didn't have heirs uh, generation after generation reproducing themselves. Uh, he proposed banning all corporate money in politics. Uh, and the, the biggest, and to, to put this in context, at the time, the U.S. federal government was tiny. Its annual revenues were smaller than the revenues of U.S. Steel, which is the biggest corporation at the time. Uh, there was no Department of Labor. There was no income tax. Uh, there was no uh, federal reserve. So central power was very weak in the U.S. at that time. And Roosevelt's big pattern was really to create a central federal government with the power uh, to take on these corporate behemoths, uh, to, to basically not to break them up necessarily, but to orient them so that they served human needs. And that was really the progressive agenda for the next several decades, create a powerful federal power uh, uh, government to act as a sort of counterweight to these growing corporations. So I wanna share some surprising things in the ways in which I think this diagnosis doesn't exactly fit anymore, and that'll be part of the theme of the talk. So corporations, uh, are falling apart in the US. Public corporations are disappearing, as I'll show in a moment here. The big argument I'd make is that information and communication technologies are reducing the costs of using outside markets relative to the costs of doing activities inside the corporate boundary. So if you're a fan of Oliver Williamson or transaction cost economics, across the board, it's becoming cheaper to buy rather than make and that is undermining the corporation as a traditional sort of social entity. One aspect of this is what I call Nikeification, outsourcing production to suppliers, uh, Uberization, which is outsourcing the labor force using contract labor or uh, impromptu labor, and then Amazon is outsourcing the distribution channels. Uh, essentially, you can rent all of the parts of a corporation rather than buy them. Um, I will claim that the web page enterprise in many cases is going to replace traditional organization design. So this is something that ODC members should be very attuned to. Web pages can do an awful lot of what organization design had traditionally done. And I think we need new tools to address the new forms of power. So that's sort of the, uh, that, that's the trajectory for the talk today as the Gamaldansk sets in for those of you in Denmark. <laughs> so, uh, my last uh, book, uh, if you've heard any talks by me, you see a couple of charts over and over again, and I can't help it, they're, they're just too, too surprising. But my last book uh, started with this puzzle, which is why are public corporations in the US vanishing? Uh, it's in the US and the UK. Uh, Germany, it stayed flat at about 600, same as it was 30 years ago. Uh, China and India, a lot more public corporations. But in, in the Anglo-American world, stock, uh, uh, Firms listed on stock exchanges have been declining for a couple of decades now. So startling fact, the number of public corporations in the US has dropped by half over the past two decades. And it's not gone back up in spite of the Jobs Act and various reforms. The market's gone way up, but you're just not seeing IPOs return to the level that they were. And we keep seeing delistings year after year. So that's weird um, if, if the, the land of shareholder capitalism can't create new public corporations, something weird is going on. And a, a simple diagnosis is, well, we all know that's because superstar companies are buying up their competitors and consolidating industries, and every industry is going to have two or three big oligopolies that dominate it. That's not actually what's happening. Uh, one of the papers that I posted digs into every company listed on the market since 2000, all of the entries and exits, breaks them down by industry and, and reason why they were uh, reason why they left the markets. And it really is a different story depending on the market. Um, for computer programming, for software, it's really failures at the dot-com bust. Banking, it's consolidation and failure in 2008. 
uh, electronics, it's offshoring. Uh, when China joined the WTO, that was kind of the end of American electronics manufacturing. And then big pharma, there's a lot of sort of churn with, with biotech. But it's not a simple story of centrifugal force, centripetal force where industries keep getting consolidated. So don't, don't buy that story too uncritically. Uh, to give a feel for that, this is the list of the uh, Dow Jones blue chip companies, the 30 industrials in 1988 when, uh, when I was in graduate school. These were the commanding heights of corporate America. These were the dominant, powerful firms that people looked up to and hoped to get a job at and then work their way up to be an executive vice president and, and required a Boca Raton or, or something like that. And so if you look at this list, um, <laughs> these were, this was like the football team in high school, the popular kids that sort of dominated uh, the life of the American economy. If you fast forward to today, a large majority of them are gone from the index. Most of them have disappeared entirely. Uh, so anyone under 40 doesn't know what Westinghouse uh, or, or uh, Eastman Kodak or Bethlehem Steel or American Can. These are just names that mean nothing to them. And this is weird to me because when I was in graduate school, these were the powerhouses of American industry. And now it's kind of like going back to your 30th high school reunion and the football team, what's left of the football team comes in and they used to be like, you know, the flower of the school's manhood or whatever. And now sort of most of them are gone and some of them look like they're living in a halfway house and GE used to be the quarterback, but now it's just gotten out of rehab and it got kicked off the index. So we kind of got to this interesting place where the powerful companies seem to have vanished. And honestly, five years ago, if you'd asked me, what's the one firm that will last forever? Uh, I would have said Exxon. Um, but Exxon was exiled from the, the uh, Dow Jones uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, they, and if you look at their stock price, uh, they're kind of a disaster for the last several years. So this is interesting. It's not that big companies just grow more powerful and dominate. It's a different set of companies that have become powerful. So if you're a fan of a Schumpeter, you look at this and say, yay, creative destruction. The old guys are getting, uh, getting tossed over and they're being replaced by vibrant young companies full of good ideas that are, uh, that are cropping up to, to replace those old guys. But that's not really true too. Uh, if you look at the trends in initial public offerings, um, that's also been kind of a disaster for the few years. We, there were a lot of IPOs in the 1990s and probably even more dissertations about IPOs in the 1990s. But like uh, Furby's or Parachute Pants, uh, or Clinton administration's IPOs are not coming back. Um, if you look over the last five years, there's about as many IPOs in the last five years as there were in 1996 alone. So it's really, uh, it's kind of disappeared uh, as an art form. There are SPACs, there are other ways of going public, um, but this is, uh, this is kind of a, an interesting thing. So why do we have public corporations in the first place? If you're like me, uh, on day one of your course on, uh, on organization theory, you make the students read The Nature of the Firm by Coase, where he lays out the transaction cost explanation of why do we design organizations at all? Why do these things exist? And he gives a transaction cost explanation, of course, um, but he puts it really nicely, uh, elegantly in, in this one early sentence. The main reason why it's profitable to establish a firm would seem to be that there's a cost of using the price mechanism the most obvious cost of organizing production through the price mechanism is that of discovering what the relevant prices are. So in other words, free markets, using free markets isn't free. You have to go out and uh, spend money essentially to shop for inputs. You can't just say I'm switching my hard drive supplier to someone else. Uh, you have to do your due diligence and investigate it and get bids and get lawyers to negotiate contracts and navigate them. So there's a, a cost of using the price system. And this Coase's explanation makes sense of why we had something like uh, the Rouge factory. This is when, when Coase was writing, both of my grandfathers worked at this uh, Ford factory in Dearborn, Michigan, where they made Model A's. And you can see ships are bringing in coal and iron and wood and, and uh, rubber and, and sand in one end, and Model A's were rolling out the other end. It's the most vertically integrated factory the world had ever seen. Had over 100,000 people working there. They made their own steel, their own cement. 
Uh, Henry Ford owned uh, rubber plantations in Brazil and uh, oak, fat, oak forests in northern Michigan to buy all of the raw materials to make these cars. And Coase gave a rationale. Why would we want to have uh, a vertically integrated firm like that? But imagine a thought experiment if everybody carried with them a tiny supercomputer communicator that allowed them to look up the prices for everything in the world all day, every day, and they could negotiate contracts for inputs with strangers, track their performance in real time. What would happen if the transaction costs uh, for using the markets approached zero? And of course, we are now living through that thought experiment. Uh, and the answer is uh, Nikeification. You would get pervasive outsourcing of the production of goods and services because you could easily find contractors for the inputs rather than having to make them uh, yourself. So I've written a lot about this. If you hear me give talks, you are, you are familiar with many of these examples. And it's, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that almost nothing you buy, at least in the US, is made by the company whose name is on the label. Vizio famously drove Sony out of the television business in the US uh, by making low cost generic televisions uh, with a staff of 200 in Irvine, California. They just snapped together supply chains, a Taiwanese vendor uh, doing assembly in China and big box retailers. Mobile phones, we all know that they're made by Foxconn and not by Apple. Pet food is made by <laughs> Uh, menu foods in Ontario, not by the company whose name is on the label. I learned that almost all the tomato sauce you buy is made by a company in Rochester, New York called Ledestri. They have this giant hyper automated tomato sauce factory. So Ari, if you want to make, you know, Ari's grandma's delicious tomato sauce, uh, if you can write down the recipe and come up with the design for the label, you can send it over to the web to these guys. Their, their highly automated factory will switch the recipe to Ari's grandma's tomato sauce and get it onto the store shelves for you and poof, you're an entrepreneur. Uh, Heparin, of course, CIA assassinations. It's actually Betsy DeVos's brother that's uh, sort of working as a contractor doing uh, some of these activities. Now, really, you can find vendors for everything. And that's become kind of a commonplace that, that the supply chain has become disaggregated or Nikeified. Uh, that works for suppliers. Uh, how do we think about labor? And this was tricky because it's one thing to say I can buy hard drives and, uh, and switch suppliers for hard drives or outsource the production of tomato sauce. But it's another thing to do that with my own employees. We like to imagine that organization design is about thoughtfully recruiting and managing labor, overseeing their activities and evaluating them. That's kind of the essence of organization design, I think is the people part. Um, so I'm living in uh, Menlo Park right now. I live about four blocks from, from uh, Sand Hill Road, where a lot of mischief is done by venture capitalists. Um, and an article five years ago had this lovely title, there's an Uber for everything now. And at that moment, it was true. It says, I've got a maid, masseuse, doctor, chef, valet, personal shopper, florist, and bartender. Each has his own app and can arrive at my door in as little as 10 minutes. Um, and that is kind of the essence of Uberization, the notion that you could use uh, GPS-enabled smartphones to recruit labor by the task. Uh, and honestly, in Silicon Valley, absolutely any task that one person can do for another person, there is an app for that. One, one of my favorites was on-street valet parking, where if you didn't want to park your car and you couldn't find a space, you'd call this app up and a liberal arts graduate would come up on a skateboard and park your Tesla for you for, I don't know, for tech bros that don't know how to parallel park or something. But there, there really is an app for everything. I want to say that what's important about Uberization is not Uber per se. I think Uber, the company, could well disappear and will never make a profit. So there's lots of reasons to be skeptical about Uber per se. But the essence of this is the creation of spot labor markets enabled by smartphones in which buyers and sellers can contract for the performance of specific tasks. That is the important part about Uber, is not Uber itself. It's the notion of recruiting labor by the task and not by the job or by the person. And that's going to be really consequential. 
Uh, one of the fun things in Silicon Valley and uh, elsewhere in the U.S. is we have this giant warehouse store called Home Depot that sells hardware supplies. And if you go there early in the morning, there will be a gang of young men hanging around in the corner of the parking lot. And if you don't know what's going on, uh, you will wonder, what are they doing there? Is this like a football team or is it a religious cult or are they playing Pokemon Go or like what exactly is going on with all these young guys hanging out in the corner? And it turns out that it's a spot labor market. If you want to hire people for the day <coughs> and you're paying cash and you don't need to see documentation of citizenship, um, this is a good way to hire someone. So if you need a roofer and a cement layer and a, and a carpenter, you can show up and say, here's what I'm paying for the day and hire people for the shift. So puzzle left to the reader or to, to the viewer, does that group of young, young men that have been put together for the day count as a firm? If you assemble a labor force for one day to say build a garage, uh, does that count as a firm uh, or not? So that's, that's my, my puzzling mystery for you. Um, so what's great about this 